Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back for another positive talk. Hopefully you all have been doing well. I know that for me, it is a Friday, which means I've got a weekend to rest and settle down. I know weekend isn't a weekend for everyone, but I'm super excited that I've made it through another week. Been working really hard on a lot of stuff for my coaching business. Super excited to be bringing on my guest today. I love connecting with fellow content themselves online and just excited to connect. So let's see if we can get him on. There we go. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? Doing well. It's bright and sunny. No more rain. So I'm happy. Yeah. Where are you located? I'm here in Richmond, Virginia. No way. Okay. I grew up in Williamsburg, Virginia. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and my brother lives in Richmond, so I know Richmond very well. There you go. Yeah. I saw that you went to Blacksburg for Virginia Tech for a bit. Uh, that's yeah. where my dad went. I did a lot of stuff out there when I was working for my previous company. Okay. So, and of course, Williamsburg is just a hop skip and a jump from Richmond and then DC <laughs> isn't that far either yeah. yeah yeah no I Blacksburg was an experience for sure but uh, <laughs> my mom also went to Virginia Tech though so we grew up big Hokie fans <laughs> nice yeah. yeah my family was split my granddad went to UVA and Williams William and Mary and then my dad he was all over the place but he finished at Virginia Tech so our family was very divided oh, that's so funny <laughs> we um we had, we had a lot of William and Mary in my family, not nobody from UVA. So we were like vehemently anti UVA, but it's funny, <laughs> I actually root for UVA sports now more than I do Virginia oh, Tech. So I love we're it. all over the place. <laughs> love it. Well, I will give you some time to introduce yourself here really quick. So people yeah. who have not followed you before will know a little bit about you and then we can dive into a conversation. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I'm Carter Kale. Uh, I am almost 27 years old, coming up in August. I live in Philadelphia now, just made the, uh, the move from DC to Philly, um, like the beginning of this summer. So very fresh, um, just bought a new house also. So all of that stress is being shared online for everybody to laugh at and resonate with. <laughs> um, I, like I was uh, just alluding to, I went to William & Mary. I was a Division I athlete. I was a swimmer. Um, when I left school, I went up to D.C. to do um, consulting. I work in human capital consulting. Um, but I am a very competitive person. I'm a very creative person. And I also have, like, wild ADHD. So there's not a lot that can keep me grounded. Um, so I needed something to kind of do in my free time that gave me the same kind of boost that swimming did when I didn't really have swimming anymore. So um, I took to TikTok. I was actually dating my current boyfriend at the time. Uh, we've been dating for like six months and he kept sending me text messages of TikToks because I didn't have a TikTok because I knew that as soon as I got it, I would become addicted to it. And so I like held off for as long as I could. I made it all the way through COVID without a TikTok, which oh, is wow. wild. Um, and then, but he just wouldn't stop sending me text messages of TikTok. So I finally downloaded the app, made my first TikTok in within a week. And then within like two weeks, I had started going viral. And so I just started from there. And so, um, I'm still doing the same job that I did when I came out of college, but now I kind of have this social media, um, side gig going. Um, and you know, I, I want to kind of get into this with you, Ben, cause we were just texting about it before we popped on the call, but uh, my content just in the last two and a half years has changed drastically because my life has changed drastically. And so there's a lot of evolution there. Um, I started making very like, or I started making content with my straight roommates because I was in a very niche situation where I was the only gay guy in a house of five other straight men. And so people loved to both laugh at that and enjoy that and also fetishize it, which became its own little <laughs> toxic niche of the internet. Um, and then, but that lasted as long as it did. I no longer live with those roommates. I live with my boyfriend now. And as my life has evolved, the things that I've wanted to bring to the internet and the things that I wanted to share have pivoted. So over the last 10 months, I've kind of shifted away from these more like trendy videos and more um, like focused on my roommates and shifted more towards just sharing what my life looks like. Um, and so now I guess I consider myself like a lifestyle 
content creator. I'm sure you're the same way. I think most like influencers are the way or like the word influencer kind of like uh, itches my skin a little bit because it's like I don't influence on anything. I have no influence. I'm just doing my thing. Um, but I guess you could call me a lifestyle influencer now as well. Um, and I love it. I actually just like uh, took up Instagram four months ago. I was very much just on TikTok and um, the community that I've built on Instagram is is far and beyond what my experience was on TikTok. I feel like those that actually follow me and the people that are here day to day, like leaving really, really, really nice comments on my videos and, and things, I don't get that same experience on TikTok and people responding to my stories and um, I have the opportunity to like ask them questions and they can ask me questions and that's just not a community that I got on TikTok. So just in the last four months, like my desire and urge to create content and to build this community has just skyrocketed because I can see so much positive from it. But I, I it's something I want to get into once we hear a little bit from you as well is the negative side of the internet and how lovely and great that is to consume as well. So in a nutshell, that's me. I'm I'm a pretty boring person all things all things considered <laughs> i i go to the gym in the morning and i work a nine to five and then i rot on the couch with my boyfriend in the evening there's that's about my day but i'm very excited to do this ben i really appreciate you inviting me on i've never done a live conversation like this before so this will this will be fun i'm an extrovert so if i did command the conversation please tell me <laughs> to shut up like i very i'm very open to feedback when it's time for me to, to listen so um, but yeah, thanks for, for having me on. I love it. And I, I'm also an extrovert. So <laughs> for me, I, when it comes to these types of lives, I try to give people enough space to tell their story because I'm like, I've got 300 plus episodes yeah. of me talking. So <laughs> it's perfectly okay for you to take control. I have had shyer guests on and I have to kind of take the lead and take up a little bit more space so that they feel comfortable. But yeah. I'm 100% okay with having someone else on the screen with me that's <laughs> an extrovert and can hold their space. Yes. But I know that you said that you started your TikTok after uh, COVID. Yeah. So a lot of people jumped on TikTok during COVID. That was a really big blast for that platform. I think that COVID actually made TikTok probably the number one most popular social platform for a very specific age yeah. group. But okay. Were you consuming content before? Were there any content creators that you were kind of following that you admired from afar before you started your content? For sure. So um, I was definitely like all over Instagram, probably obsessively over Instagram. Um, I really, I, I kind of picked up everything at once. So I also wasn't really big on YouTube. I would watch YouTube videos, but I didn't, I was never a consumer of like YouTube culture. Yeah. So it's interesting now, now that I'm, on the internet as much as I am, it, it almost went from like zero to 100. And I kind of had to figure out how to like make space and time for other things in my life. Cause I, as soon as I started consuming one thing, I was like, oh my God, I need this all the time, which I'm sure a lot of people in our generation can resonate with. Um, but people that I followed that I admired, I am a huge fan of Jeff O'Donnell and Taylor Phillips. They were probably, honestly, probably the creators that helped me to come out. Cause I followed them and I saw like a life a normal life of queer people. And I grew, I mean, you're, you live in Virginia now. Virginia is not the most conservative place, but it's also not the most liberal. So growing up in a, in, in a quasi Southern town, um, I didn't see that representation really anywhere. Yeah. So um, I really looked up to them. I admired their relationship and I admired their authenticity. Um, for a while, the content that I was creating was so far away from that. But as I have, have like pivoted towards sharing more of just like what my life is as, as a queer young adult. Um, I find myself resonating a lot with the content they continue to make, but we're making early on when I first started to, to go through that coming out process. So um, Taylor Phillips, Jeff O'Donnell, I'm trying to think of other folks in that. Uh, oh, the, um, the property lovers. I don't know if that's their still their like handle or whatever, but um, just like those, those really cute queer um, couples who are, are just sharing their like very normal lives is, is definitely what got me started on the internet. And then here we are. What about you? Who are like the first, cause Ooh. you said you've been getting your start since <laughs> you started yeah. posting content long before I did. So I'm interested, like, cause I'm sure queer representation back then was not as prevalent. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's been a journey. So for me, my journey started on accident. Um, I came out in 2008. And when I came out, I was exhausted from all the messages and everyone coming at me saying, maybe it's just a phase, maybe you haven't met the right girl, all of that fun stuff that oh, most yeah. LGBT people get. Hopefully we're moving out of that phase. But uh, when I experienced that, I was like, I'm just gonna make a video huh? and I'm going to just tell everyone so I don't have to answer all these dumb questions mm -hmm. a thousand mm -hmm. times. But at the time, Facebook did not allow you to load videos longer than a minute or two minutes long. Yeah. My video was like 20, <laughs> so it was a yeah. lot longer. <laughs> so someone was like, just <laughs> upload it to YouTube and then share the link um, mm. on Facebook. I just thought that it was a place to store your video and then share it on your platforms that yeah. you wanted it on. I didn't realize that I shared my coming out story publicly to the to internet. The world. <laughs> um, so that's where my story started. That was before anyone really was content creators yeah. on YouTube. It was more for cat videos and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> so that, that shows that I've been doing it for quite a while, yeah. but um, I was part of like the original content creators that YouTube reached out to and started to pay. Oh, so cool. that happened for me during college, which was nice because it was like income coming in. Oh, yeah. But for a while, when people searched coming out on the internet, my YouTube video was popping up. That's so, so awesome. That, that was and kind terrifying. of my experience. Because <laughs> that's good and bad. We'll get into that yeah. in a second. But there's, there's the love and there's the hate. <laughs> yeah. So luckily for me, I didn't look at my YouTube channel. I only read the comments that people were putting on it on my Facebook page, which were a lot more uh, kind words yep. compared to several years later when someone asked me how I dealt with all the negative comments. And I was like, what are you talking about? Negative comments? <laughs> at that time, I didn't even have login access to that YouTube channel yeah. anymore because I was yeah. just like, I haven't been on it in, in forever. Yeah. And I logged in and I was just like looking at it and there was tons of hate, of mm -hmm. course. Um, but the thing that really got me was the people that my true authentic share touched and inspired. So kind of like you were talking about the couples that you have followed and how them showing you what it could look like to be treated as a normal gay couple in the world. Yeah. Um, and also sharing their journeys, which of course has those struggles, but yeah. I was inspired, so I created a couple more videos. The first one was like the day after a five-year relationship ended. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like in tears, and the intent was I'm going to record this because it's a pure moment. Yeah, and I'm going to record another one in a year to show how far I've come since. Oh, I love that, that really that really sad moment in my life, but it became a thing where YouTube reached out and they're like, your content is getting a lot of um, interactions mm -hmm. and engagement. We would love to bring you on. So people that I started seeing pop up were like Connor Franta, um, Tyler Oakley popped up yeah. and then Joey Graceffa. So those yeah. were the people that I saw starting to make a career out of it. Uh, I don't think that I really took that into consideration. Okay. And okay. Then I got the negative side of the internet where yeah. the hate, the death threats started coming in. And then I had a stalker show up where mm. I worked. He was sitting outside of my home. And when I went to the police, they were just like, you shouldn't put your information on the internet. Yeah. Was, that's what I got. And so out of fear, because looking back on some of my videos, like I stuck my camera in my dashboard and yeah. drove and kind of did like a little quick video of me going somewhere, not yeah. knowing that if you slow it down, <laughs> it pretty much gave people directions to my home. To your house, yep. <laughs> so I learned some lessons, but oh, yeah. instead of going through, through all those videos and trying to figure out which ones were too revealing, I just deleted my whole channel mm -hmm. and started over. Okay. Uh, there was a big gap between yeah. when I, deleted it and started over. But at that time, I realized that that was a really big mistake. Yeah. But Been going back that. to YouTube <laughs> events, 
people still recognize me from my first channel mm -hmm. where I went by my first and last name. Now yeah. I go by Drummond, in my, which is my middle name. Okay. Just to give me some privacy. Yeah. But um, it's been a journey. And now that I kind of am connecting with newer content creators, I just try to help them understand, like, you don't have to share everything. Yeah. Um, people will want everything, but you have the right to say, this is as far as my content goes. And I would be happy yeah. if you respect that boundary that I'm creating. Absolutely. Because I think celebrities, content creators, we are under the impression that if we don't keep giving, that people will start to be upset or uh, we will seem like we're not being as authentic or if we're hiding something and we never want that to come across that way. But I think that it's important. So you were talking about like shifting from the content you were making to the newer stuff that you're making now, which is more lifestyle. Yeah. Mine was very focused on lifestyle. Yeah. And now I'm shifting more towards my coaching and my professional career. Yeah. Because I've had my life on camera for so long like I started in 2008 and I've shared my ups and downs and everything yeah and it's gotten to the point where I do want some privacy mm -hmm. I want I don't want my boyfriend to feel like he has to expose his life to the internet because he's yeah. not a content creator that's not his thing yeah um as well as I realized some of my friends didn't enjoy being around me when I was filming content yeah. So I tried to kind of navigate that. And also being in the professional world, being an LGBT content creator, where I've spoken on topics that if you just read the thumbnail, which are supposed to be clickbaity, yeah. um, may come across very sexualized or, but if you watch the video, it's like me informing people that you have choices that yeah. you're allowed to put boundaries like it was always respectful content mm -hmm. but in professional settings i've had people bring up my content mm -hmm. and it's taken the conversation in a completely different direction very yeah. not professional yeah so i've been kind of leaning towards more professional content more here here's what i can do as a coach as yeah. a professional so it's been a journey but I shifted from YouTube over to Instagram. Okay. Um, I was working with a lot of brands and during the pandemic was when they started saying, and how many followers do you have on TikTok? Yep. And I was like, I don't have a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so I jumped over there, but I had lots of negative experiences with TikTok just deleting my channel yep. because they said I made something offensive. And I was like, what did I do? <laughs> yeah. I, I made LGBT online, content, apparently. <laughs> so I I kind of strayed away from TikTok. I still own my handle yeah. on all the platforms. But during the pandemic, I switched from creating content about my story and started this series where yeah. I brought new people on because I want to hear your stories. And I know that in this world, we need more people telling stories. So audiences that heard mine that couldn't connect with mine yeah. may hear yours and really connect with you. So that's, that's been my goal with my new content. I love that moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I resonate with, it's interesting because you, you got your start so much earlier than I did, but I resonate with so much of the, like we have so many shared experiences there. I did a video once I took it down immediately. So I, fingers crossed it doesn't exist there anymore, but also I've moved. So, but I literally put the, I got my first ever PR box and I was so excited about it that I put my address on the internet and was doing this unboxing. And I like for TikTok had this like weird rumor going around for a really long time where like when you post a video, you should log off immediately and not check in for like a day because then TikTok will get anxious and want to bring you back. So it'll boost your videos. Um, and I had all my notifications turned off because, you know, when you go viral, your phone doesn't shut up. And so I, I just I needed some sort of way to get away from um, to un unplug a little bit. Uh, but I literally put my address on the Internet and then let it sit there for a, a day without knowing. And then I came back to like it was a, a very it went very viral. It was like very viral. Nowadays, it's not as viral, but it, it was like 200,000 views in like a day, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and there were like a thousand comments being like, did this guy just dox himself? Like what, what is going on? And I like immediately took it down. I had to apologize to the brand. I was like, I'm so sorry. I have to do this video over again. 
Um, luckily, I moved away from that house like three weeks later. So if anybody was going to, and I wasn't as big then as I am now. So it was less of an issue, but I was like, oh my God, I guess this is a learning lesson. Um, <laughs> but so definitely have doxxed myself before. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the hate on the internet, like people ask me, how do I deal with it? One, I have had multiple long stents off of the internet since joining it. So I was on TikTok for three months, took a three month break, came back for six months, took a six month break. And then this is the longest I've gone without taking a break because I think I needed to thicken some skin a little bit. And I think I needed to learn when it was time to put a video away and, and do and move to the next one. Cause a lot of times, I mean, I love commenting back on my videos. Like that's something that I've, I've started doing relatively recently, but it's been really fun to be able to chit chat in the comments with some of my followers, with the people who are there first, right? Because the people who are to your video first are your actual followers. They're, your, they're the people who are actually interested in what I'm posting. And so I like to engage with them because it's, it's a, a bit of a thank you for being there, but it's also, they followed me for months and or years. So they're bringing back things and like, how does this relate to the video you made six months ago? And I'm like, great question. Let me <laughs> give you some feedback or let me, let me answer that question. It's, it's about a day into a video when I'm like, okay, it's time to move to the comments of this current video that I just posted, because that's when like, if it goes viral, it always ends up on the wrong side of the internet for me. So like, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, like I, 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 in, at least in the last six months have not had a video go viral for, and like it not ultimately get to the conservative side of TikTok or the like anti LGBTQ internet. Um, and that's just how virality works, right? Like you can't stop it when it gets big, it gets big on everybody or for everybody. It's not just going to stay within the queer community because one person who hates you finds it and they share it with people who also hate you. And so it grows in both directions. So it's been, I have absolutely had to thicken my skin. I've absolutely taken stints, like you said, away. There was actually, um, the longest break I took was at the beginning of 2023. I took six months off. Um, and when I came back, I vowed that when I came back, I was going to post content that was authentically me and that was going to be my life because I was doing a lot of like trend videos and a lot of, like you said, like things that clickbaity hypersexualized me. And then when you actually look into it, it, it wasn't like that. But um, uh, from like a service level, it was something to comment on, right? Because I'm a marketing major. I should have mentioned that. So I know how I knew how to market, right? I knew how I knew what it took to go viral. And so I was going viral for all the wrong reasons, because I was doing it just to do it, not mm -hmm. to bring any benefit to anybody or myself. Um, so I took a really long break because I was like, I can't deal with, like, I love the, <laughs> to be honest, I love, love the attention, but I don't, but the attention always goes negative. And then I feel really bad about myself. And I put myself there. So it's, it's my fault. But um, when I came back, I promised, that what I was going to do is I was going to be authentic about myself so that if somebody does, if something does go viral or someone does come to my page and comment something negative, it's something I can defend. It's something, or it's something that's not going to get to me because it's just who I am. So if you hate me for who I am, that's on you. <laughs> but at least I'm not putting, projecting a part of myself that's not truthful online. Mm -hmm. um, and actually I, I heard a, someone put a quote on one of my videos or sent me a video I was like, I really think you'd resonate with this. And it's something that Tom Holland said in an interview once. And it was like, if you have a problem with me, text me. If you don't have my number, you don't know me well enough to have a problem with me. And I'm like, and I've, I've latched onto that saying. I'm like, <laughs> I, I need that tattooed on my forehead. Like, I need that um, everywhere I go. Because that's truly, like, I, I for 10 minutes, I feel really, really bad. And then I have to remind myself, like, these people have no idea who I am. They, and most of them don't follow me. Actually, I'd say 99.9% .9 of them don't follow me. They've seen one minute and 20 seconds of my life and have decided from those minute and 20 seconds that they hate me. And it's like, yeah. well, have fun. You know, life is so much shorter when it's filled with hate. So you go, go live your life. I'm totally fine over here. So um, yeah. definitely resonate with the negative comments side of things. Um, have you felt like it's shifted since your content has shifted or do you still feel like you get hate, but just in a different lens? <laughs> mm, yeah. So I, for me, I've told people that it's important to remember that if something triggers you, that's a space to heal. 
So mm -hmm. whenever a hateful comment triggers me, I'm like, okay, why does this trigger me? Um, so I've used hate comments as a way to heal and grow oh, because awesome. there were comments that never hit me. I was just like, mm -hmm. this person's just a hater. Yeah. But there were some that really got me and I had yeah. to learn to kind of navigate that. Um, I, I think because I've been doing it for so long that I've gotten very thick skin yeah. and I've very much so looked at people who post hateful comments as people who hate themselves. Because when I look at times where I've said mean things about people, it's because I'm dealing with my own insecurity yeah. or I'm struggling myself or jealous or envious of them. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just keep on shining because yeah. there are people who really enjoy it. And I think it's really important for content creators to not get sucked into yeah. creating content for them because there is content that all these people who love you followed you for that a lot of people shift and they're like, Oh, you haters, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm like, don't make content for them. For the haters. Keep yeah. doing what you're doing yeah. because your content yeah. will take a really negative shift. And I think the world needs more content creators that can show people like, despite all these negative opinions here and here, yeah. like I know my lane and I'm staying in it, all my support. It sounds like you have a great relationship with people who engage, Yeah, but yeah, I, I tend to delete content that mm -hmm. is not my content, but messages and stuff that are undermined that are negative. Oh, hundred percent. The block button is my best friend. Yeah. People say <laughs> that it's like great for your algorithm but i find it really unflattering because even people i admire who engage with my content in a positive way mm -hmm. sometimes become targets hateful people attacking other people and it just creates a space that it's like everyone's attacking people instead yeah. of engaging in a positive way so as soon as i see negative stuff i'm like delete remove oh, block whatever yep. I can do to keep my space positive. But <laughs> being an LGBT content creator, I, I haven't been posting a lot on YouTube or here on Instagram. I used to post like two or three posts a day. Yeah. I was doing like one or two lives a day. I've stepped back and the day, I know that we aren't going to talk a lot about politics, but the day that like the Trump almost assassination thing happened, my inbox and my comments <laughs> flooded with very, very conservative, very, very right-winged people yeah. just attacking me. And I'm like, I didn't post anything. Yeah. Like, I know there are people who posted about it. I, I've i learned my lesson of if I'm going to dive into politics, I'm going to positively promote who I stand behind, what I believe in, and that I will not use my platform to negatively speak or attack anyone so like yeah. when that happened, I didn't, I didn't share anything, but because of the algorithm, it was just like, here's a gay attack. attack. Well, and, and so, it's, they, it's, I, I think there's an aspect of that where they sought you out too. Yeah. Right. And that's where, that's where the hate turns to funny for me is, and maybe it's, it is is a dark sense of humor which yeah. if if if, any, if my followers are on here they know eric <laughs> eric eric and i are like polar opposites which i think is why we work i am like very much your golden retriever like <laughs> always talking always in your face always blah, blah 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 and eric is very reserved but also has a darker sense of humor and so um but the the but he also grounds me in these situations because he's a really really great reminder that like these people seek you out they're obsessed with trying to get to you that they can't even live their own lives because they're fully invested in trying to make you miserable and it's yeah. like oh my god i'm flattered why are you so obsessed <laughs> with me like that's awesome um i'm so glad that i've made it to your page what are you hiding right like every single video that i post has the hashtag gay in it, right? Every single one. So it's called the For You page for a reason. Some <laughs> some higher power <laughs> thought that this would resonate with you. Oh. So don't come for me, come for the technology that thought you would appreciate me. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then the other side of it too is like some of the comments, like you were saying, like it's a really great um, avenue for therapy, honestly, like to, to 
piece out your insecurities and, and kind of unpackage that a little bit. But some of the best hate comments that I get are ones where I'm like, damn, you nailed that. Like you, you hit that on the head. That, that is, you are correct. <laughs> like, um, someone on my, literally on a video yesterday was like most annoying voice ever. And I was like, you're right. <laughs> I, you're right. I agree. I, I don't appreciate that you said it, but I do agree with you. So, oh my gosh. Um, I tried, that's another, like, it's almost like a coping mechanism is I have this really great person in my life who helps to remind me that it's not, and this is the other thing is as a person who puts themselves online, there's, there's, I like to share my life, but I also like the attention. So there is a baseline of a little bit of narcissism in there, right? You kind of almost have to, if you're in this industry. Um, and so he is a really great reminder of like, it's not always about you. Like, yeah, the comments directed at you, but it's not always about you. And I'm like, oh, that's really great redirection. Um, so, and getting back to your point of like wanting to pivot your content because you don't want to put people online who don't want to be online, thousand percent agree. I actually luck out, I've lucked out so much that Eric has kind of grown the muscle of like wanting to help when I need the help and knowing, but knowing that he's not the center of attention, he's not the focal point. And so he likes his little cameos because he likes, he likes showing his personality and that like we are so different and that there are different people like in relationships. But from the first, cause I've been online for two and a half years now, almost three. For, I, I didn't even say that I was dating somebody until we moved in together last year. So for, for a year and a half of the content that I was creating, he didn't show up in anything because I was like, this is not, you didn't sign up to be a creator. You didn't sign up to be an online personality. And then when we moved in together, I just started, and I started pivoting to this like more lifestyle stuff. He was like, okay, like I'm totally fine being a background character, but like, I'm not gonna sit down and chat with you. Like that's, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna act. I'm not gonna do skits. I'm not gonna act out. So like if um, you want to do that that's great but i'm gonna i'm gonna do exactly what i do which is i'm gonna stare at the screen with a blank face and so I, the, some of the funniest comments i get now too are like does eric talk and i'm like yeah but not to y'all because he doesn't want to <laughs> and it's not you it's not my followers it's that he's not a creator he's he likes being a, a little he likes his like comedic relief he likes to think of himself as like the comedy break um yeah but i also moved away from making roommate content too because i was like i can't have a camera pointed at my roommates all the time um they were also i have incredible friends and so they were really gracious and willing to participate as long as again they didn't have to act out skits or anything they just most of my content even from the beginning is a quick point and shoot for three seconds and then cut to the next clip so most of the time they don't even know that a camera's out <laughs> um which is again like I didn't want them to feel like that was our friendship and that our friendship was transactional. Um, but I started moving away from that content because one, there's no benefit to them, right? Like they, they're not seeking out followers. They're not seeking out attention. So inherently it, it only, the only benefit is that they get to help a friend. So I'm trying to like pivot away from that where they'll be in videos because they want to help a friend. So occasionally I'll ask like, is it okay if I film our day? Or like, is it okay if I, you know, film our meal while we're eating, right? But <laughs> totally resonate with you. Like, I would love content creator friends, people who, <laughs> who I can like put in videos and things, but I think it's super important to be understanding that like not everybody wants to be online and not everybody seeks that out. But if you do, you have to be ready for the absolute horrible shit show that can be the, the comment section. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's interesting because I've been to a lot of YouTube events and I've connected with people who are also content creators and it's a different world because yeah. I'm so used to like pulling out the camera and people falling to the side yep. or oh, yeah. <laughs> like your boyfriends just kind of blankly stare at the yeah. camera. <laughs> Whereas when I pulled it out when I was in California for VidCon, yeah. like every content creator was like jumping in Lord. and wanting to be a yeah. part of it. So it's definitely a beautiful thing. And of course, I moved here to Richmond. I also lived in very rural areas yeah. where being a content creator, you didn't meet anyone else that yeah. did that. Um, and it was kind of nice to move to Richmond where 
some of the people that I've met are big content creators, yeah. not necessarily in the LGBT niche that I've been in, but it's nice to kind of connect with them and be able to talk about it. But it's been very interesting to kind of navigate when it comes to my content and what I'm shifting to, yeah. because when you build a following, they follow you for a reason. They follow yeah. you for the content that you created yeah. and I'm shifting. Absolutely. And I know that that means I will probably have some drop off, but I know that I need to make sure that I'm showing up authentically yep. and doing content that I love because it started to feel like I was creating skits to be my old self. Yeah. Um, because I knew that's what people liked. And I did this before where I was like, hold up. I'm not, I'm not being myself and I need yeah. to stop and come back to this because I'm journeying too far away from who I am and my content is not landing for me anymore. It's great yeah. that you guys still love it and support it, but I'm draining myself instead of filling my cup, creating it and enjoying it. But yeah. you started at an older age than a lot of people. So what do you think when it comes to, cause you said you have to be a little bit narcissistic. You have to want the attention and I think of course, TikTok, there's some people who are early teens coming yeah. up. And what do you think about people who are starting it really early? Because I think there's also that unhealthy relationship oh, yeah. that we can have with our platforms. And you talked about taking a six month break. Yeah. Some people, their whole identity is attached to their online personality that they've created. Yeah. And a lot of times I wonder, like, what do these people do in real life? Like, the amount of content they're putting out, are they socially connected in the real world? Yeah. Because even for me, Positive Talks came up because we were in a pandemic. I couldn't travel to my friends and film content. I had to do it virtually. Yeah. So Positive Talks became a thing. But as the pandemic calmed down, I was like, okay, I'm very virtual. Like, yeah. I moved to Richmond during the pandemic. I don't have any connections here. Yeah. And that scared me a little bit because I felt like I was living most of my time on lives, in rooms online with people, audio rooms on Clubhouse, Zoom yeah. chats for <laughs> Facebook groups. And I think it's really important for people to understand, yes, make the most of your content online. Do what you want to do. Create a following because... I found so many beautiful people that I would have never yeah. met if I didn't have the content in the following I have. Yeah. But real life is important too. And I think since you started a little bit later, yeah. you got a full grasp of reality, having a life off the internet. But yeah. how do you think that that transitions for people who start very young and have those viral moments and are constantly chasing that? Yeah. That is a such a fantastic question. Um, and so, so thoughtful. So I just want to, you're very thoughtful in asking your question. So I didn't want to give you a kudos, but um, there are days when I think about, so to put into context from like a timeline perspective, when I was in college, um, you couldn't earn money. At, like you couldn't make money as a college athlete because it was illegal. So we couldn't accept brand, we couldn't accept gifts that was considered being like being paid for. So that rule literally changed in 2020, right the year after I graduated college. So as a college athlete, I couldn't even put YouTube things out there because if they were to earn me money, I would not be able, to, I would not be eligible to compete. So there are times where I was like, God, I wish I was just four years later right i wish i was four years younger and i because i had so much content that i like i look at these there are uh college athletes that pop up on my timeline all the time and i'm like i could do this like i could make my life as a college athlete so fun and so funny um so there are days where i wish that i could but i think nine out of ten times i'm grateful that i started late even i i have management now who helps me with like the branding sides of things 
Um, and even then, in our, at our first meet, they're like, wow, you got started on this way later than most people do. And I think I'm grateful for that because one, I had been in therapy before starting TikTok. I didn't go to therapy because of TikTok. <laughs> I was already there. So I had a baseline understanding and self-awareness of like what my triggers were. What are things that I know are going to like push me over the edge or even from like a burnout perspective where is my exhaustion coming from and why is it coming from there i also started after the pandemic so i started when i didn't have time right like i didn't start when i was you know working from home doing absolutely nothing i started when i was going to work for eight hours a day and then creating content on the side um i still feel like and i put i try to post five to six times a week, which to some people is not a lot. To some people, it's like, how the hell do you do that? Um, even just posting, whether you think that's a little or a lot, I don't, I'm still figuring out how to prioritize my relationship. And not even just with my boyfriend, Eric, but with the people that I love, how do I make sure that I'm creating space and creating time for them while still doing this thing that I love while also doing the thing that pays my bills, right? Because I can't, I'm not, I don't think I'll ever be a full-time content creator. Yeah. Um, this is a hobby for me that I've managed to to grow substantially into something that I really, really love doing. And if it ever was a, an option to pay the bills, I'd consider it. But I have a life outside of the internet and this is my hobby. This is something like I love to share my life. And, um, you know, when we first started talking, um, I mentioned to you, like, my, my kind of my shtick online now is that, like, I'm very, very boring, but I make the most out of those boring days. Like, I still have content coming out on days when it's like a Wednesday and I work nine to five and I just want to rot on the couch. And so I'll make a video about rotting on the couch on a Wednesday. Um, and so I, back, back to your original question, sorry, <laughs> long tangent. Um, I, I heard I've heard several child actors in the last year or two as all these document uh, documentaries and and things come out that it should be illegal for children to be in media. It should be illegal for somebody whose brain has not fully developed to be in a situation where they're earning money online or earning money even like on television. Um, and I I think I agree with that because there are there's a level of maturity in how to manage these things and how to manage and more so how to manage when you're not on camera, right? Most people can figure out how to present themselves online in a way that they, in the way that they want. That's not necessarily in the way that they are, but in the way that they want. But it takes a level of maturity, which some people have earlier on. So kudos to those who, who are very grounded at a young age. I don't want to take away from, take any credit away from the work that they put in. Um, but a lot of people, don't understand the toll that it takes be like behind the camera, right? Um, how long it takes to edit a video, how much time that takes away from your family and friends, um, the emotional toll it takes when even one person says something kind of mean, right? Let alone if a video gets a million views and you have 10,000 comments telling you that you're ugly or that you're stupid or, you know, horrible, horrible things that you're gay, heaven forbid, right? <laughs> I had someone, someone commented on my video and it was like, you sound gay. And I was like, it's almost like it's because I am. <laughs> like, congrats, you've, in, like, it doesn't take rocket science. So I would, again, if I was a little younger, I have far different content, probably maybe even content that's easier to be creative about because it's more, like, more exciting in life to be living, right? Like being a D1 athlete is probably a little bit more exciting than being a nine to five corporate sellout. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, if I had started earlier, I don't think I would have handled it as well. I think I'd have had far more and far more frequent um, breaks and probably mental breakdowns. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, again, long story summarized. Um, I'm glad that I didn't get an earlier start. I don't see myself ending anytime soon. There is a lot of beauty in the day-to-day -day, and there's a lot of things to pull from that. So I am never short of ideas or creative ideas. I take short breaks. I take two to three days off when I need to or when I'm my brain is tapped out and I can't think of anything. Um, 
because I do think intentionality in your content is also important, which is also you need to be older to understand what your intentions are. What I would have posted as an 18 year old is not what I would have posted now. We, we've talked about this. What I posted two years ago isn't what I would post online now. Um, but it's there forever for anybody to <laughs> re, re, like pull back up when they want to. Um, yeah. And so I think it all comes back to the level of maturity. I think it comes back to intentionality and thoughtfulness. Um, so that was a, a very long winded answer to your question. No, um, I love it. As somebody who started, you know, in 2008, to your point back when, like I, when you were talking about when you first started and there was all those cat videos, I think the first YouTube video I ever saw was the, the shoes skit, like yes. shoes, let's get some shoes. Yes. Um, that's what I equate. It was like Smosh before, like Smosh is now big again, I think. But like yeah. when they were just on YouTube, like that was iconic, right? And so like that's what I, like that's the YouTube that I grew up on. Um, but as somebody who got their start literally at the turn of it's not the turn of the century, but kind of is when you think of like internet culture, like the the real switch from the internet being a word document to the internet being a place where you can get content. Um, do you wish you had started later? Do you wish that like you had maybe taken a beat to like see what other people are doing and how they're responding and reacting and then been able to get a bit of a later start knowing that you probably I think every day that we start later there's the risk that you'll never get as big as you could have been if you had just started a little earlier although consistency helps um but like would you have risked the platform you have now by a smaller scale to have taken a beat and kind of seen how you would react to that for me I think because I, I was 18, 19 when yeah. mine started and probably 20 when I posted my second video. Yeah. Uh, so for me, uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, I've had a lot of job opportunities as well as opportunities to work alongside people that little old country boy me living in the middle of nowhere would have never dreamed of. Yeah. Uh, so... I don't think it's fully sank in for me how big of a name I made for myself yeah. when it came to, because it's gotten so normal for me to reach out to people that I admire and have a conversation yeah. with them. And I still talk to some of my friends who are just like, you're a celebrity. You're, you're talking to people who like no one has access to. <laughs> and I'm like, I, everyone's just people people are people yeah. uh and the more i've gotten to meet people that i've only watched on video yeah. or seen um, in a movie the more i realize it's true like people are just people most content creators don't feel any different than the people around them 100%. we idolize them and make them seem like these big things and like if they like our post like our hearts flutter a little bit yeah or, like if you see a big page with a blue check mark beside it like your stuff you're just like oh my god this celebrity knows who i am but for me i don't i i feel like i've learned so much for myself yeah. just putting it out there and i've always kind of shared my content not in hopes that people would aspire to be yeah. me but um, that they would be inspired to be more themselves yeah. because the content I've always created is just like me sharing me 100% yeah. uh, and being honest when I'm like, oof, I went off on a, the wrong track. I was chasing the wrong yeah. thing. I was trying to be validated when I should have been sticking to my authentic self. So I, I don't know if I would change it. Um, I would definitely go back and tell younger me, don't delete your first channel. Uh, because I was getting, I was pushing close to a million subscribers, uh, which was really nice. And yeah. then to start back at zero was a really big uh, reality check for me because, I mean, even in that moment, I didn't think of myself as like this huge content creator that everyone yeah. knew. Because being an LGBT content creator, even when we do escape the walls of our content yeah. in our category, um, the most I was ever recognized was when I went to like YouTube events or LGBT spaces. Like if I went yeah. to DC Pride, 
I had people come up to me and yeah. want to take pictures. And I, the first time I was so shy, I was just like, oh, I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and my friends were like, you know, they're going to pick up yeah. on that, that you just yeah. lied. And I was like, oh, but it was so awkward because being approached by people who know so much about you yeah. and are just flat on talking to you as if like you've been best friends forever. Yeah. I wasn't ready for that, but it's a culture shock for sure. Yeah. It's, I know that it's interesting. Yeah. And then you, you start to get recognized in places, but I've had negative things too, where I moved to Richmond. I, I was, well known just on yeah. the internet as an LGBT content creator, which when I was trying to build new relationships with the LGBT community, there was kind of that mocking oh, tone yeah. and they're like, Oh, the content creator has something to say. Yeah. And I'm like, um, I'm actually trying to be a part yeah. of this because I um, want to further the cause. It's not anything for my personal gain. Yeah. I truly believe in moving the LGBT community closer to equality. But when you're in a small town and people see a big number behind your name, they instantly get that opinion of you. Yeah. Which I feel like that, that would be the only thing I wish could shift yeah. was, and I think I've pulled back a little bit from creating content because of that, because I am trying to engage and become more involved in my community. Yeah. And when people kind of instantly have that I guess, assumption of who you are, yeah. whether it's just looking at the number and creating a negative assumption of you because content creators and influencers can be a certain way. There are stereotypes. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the only thing that I wish would change a little bit yeah. was the automatic assumption of, you know, who I am before I show yeah. up and show you who I am. But exactly. other than that, I, I've admired having a space where I can be authentic and lives yeah. have become my thing because you can't edit these. Nope. Uh, what what you see of the two people having a conversation, it's us speaking live and yeah. giving a perspective, I honestly, which I love. I wish I, I've been toying with the ideas of, uh, I've never done a live. I told you this before we joined. I was like, I don't even know how to join this thing. I'm so scared. <laughs> um, so, but I've been toying with the idea of doing lives for that exact reason is that I want the community that's getting to know me to know me. I want them to have the opportunity to ask me questions directly and to be able to get that feedback and that information uncensored. Um, obviously, I mean, my videos have like voiceover. Most, most of them are voiceover and that's because I have to squeeze a whole day into a minute and a half. And so it's pretty well scripted and pretty fast paced. Um, I like the idea of slowing it down like you're doing here and just getting a chance to talk to people and, and engage with them because I am like we both mentioned, I'm a hyper extrovert. Um, I also am super weirded out when like people think that I am this like famous person when I'm like, <laughs> I pay taxes, I pay my mortgage, I have people yell at me at work. Like it's, <laughs> like it's I'm very, I don't see myself as anything different. Um, I think, but there's a confidence that you need to like, and we talked about this a little bit too, to be able to put yourself online. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that confidence can be misconstrued as arrogant or as conceited. Um, when in reality, it's just, a thing that we are we're creative and this is the way that we've chosen to be creative and it's the way that feels most natural to us so that's how we do it um but i feel those eyes too absolutely like i i i'm also mostly in the queer space so i really only get recognized by other queer folks or allies which i love i love when i love when a straight woman comes up to me and is like i follow your page and i'm like ally love it <laughs> um so and but i i agree with you the, the, the first few times that i got recognized was interesting i'm the type of person where if you i would talk to a, a street pole for two hours and have the best <laughs> conversation so yeah it i was never taken aback by it um but i think people like who would recognize me and, and have the confidence to come up and say something quickly realize like oh this is just a random dude like it, it, because I I, exactly. I will ask them like how is your day I had I had someone at my gym actually recently um, who came up to me and you know was 
said, hi, I, I think I've seen you on Instagram. Do you post Instagrams? I was like, yeah, I do. Um, and we were chit-chatting and I literally gave him my address, this like complete stranger. I was like, oh, I just moved in here. And I was, I walked away from that situation. I was like, I just told a complete stranger where I live. But that person <laughs> probably walked away and was like, this idiot just gave me his address. Like, what is he doing? Um, because I don't see it as like, I, I see when someone comes up to me, they're trying to be friendly and that's all I want to be in return. I'm not going to take the platform that I've been given for granted. Um, and also that's just like the person that I am. And so I think it's, I hope that it, one, if you're watching this and you see me in the streets, please come say hi, because I do like it. I like to say hi to, to random people, let alone people who follow me and who want to get to know me better. So if you see me say hi, um, but I don't ever want folks to think that like content creators think of some do, don't get me wrong. Some do think that they're better than you and that they're better than everybody else. And so I'm, I've run into very few of those. Luckily, I've never been in spaces really um, where I've had to engage with people like that. But um, the prying eyes and the assumptions of who I am before you get to know me, um, it kind of gets back to the Tom Holland quote, right? Like, you can't have a problem with me if you don't know me. At least give me a five minute conversation. Yeah. Then you can hate me. And you have a valid reason to, because maybe I did something to piss you off, but, and I'm not perfect. So it's probable and it's, it's happened, but, um, a lot of time because, and I'm, I'm sure I don't want to put this on, on queer or the LGBTQ community. Cause I think it's the same place in any community that you're in. So if a, a straight white woman walking into a room of straight white women that recognize that her also probably feel the same thing. Yeah. But it's the sense of like, it's making it harder for me to connect with my community in person if I see those prying eyes. And actually, I've lucky, luckily in Philly, I feel like people here are just very, I mean, it's the city of brotherly love. They're, they're rough around the edges, but they are very <laughs> genuine. And yeah. so that's been a lot nicer. I felt a little bit more judged in DC and granted I had a bigger audience in DC cause I'd been there longer. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I wish that, I hope that people who take away from this or if this ever gets clipped or anything that people realize that we're, we're also just trying to make our way in this world. Like we're, we're not higher than we're not better than we are just different because we chose to put our everyday life on the internet, doxing ourselves on accident. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, but again, back to like, even how this conversation started, I don't know how I would have handled that at 18. So like, I don't know, you, you have a good head on your shoulders and are also probably far more mature than most 18 year olds to be able to navigate that because I truly don't know what I would have done with the platform given like where I was at in my life. Like, and I was like, you came out earlier in life that, so I was closeted. So I can't imagine me having this platform, knowing how I speak and how I present and how I always have. I've been called gay since I was in first grade before I even knew what that meant, before I even knew what attraction was, like I was called gay. So I've always dodged that. And that's probably why it took me so long to come out. But I don't know how I would have handled being online closeted. I actually used online to come out. My second TikTok I ever made was about being gay, living in a house full of straight people. And I used the hashtag gay, obviously, and gay was all over the video. Um, the only people who knew, my, my hometown, nobody knew except for my parents. Nobody in my family had known except for my immediate family. So my cousins, my grandparents, nobody knew. Nobody from my hometown, well, they probably knew, but <laughs> nobody, I did not tell them. I did not tell them. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if I could have put myself online. I, I did that because I was ready for whatever. I knew that if it went viral, someone would find out. It was a little awkward when I started getting texts or like going to a bar at home and people being like, hey, like saw your TikToks. And I'm like, ah, so you know I'm gay now. Awesome. <laughs> that took a little, that took a little getting used to because I was never one to like come out. I just kind of wanted to live my life the way that I wanted to live my life. Um, so I don't know if I could, like how I would have handled the situation getting a platform at 18 when I was in the closet and having all of my comments rather than being about a D1 swimmer, which is probably what I would have posted about mostly then would have been about, oh, look at this gay kid. He's stuck in the closet. Like, come on out now. Like, all, and, and it's, uh, yeah. So I don't know how I would have handled that. Probably yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely interesting because 
I moved back to Virginia after being gone for about 10 years. Yeah. And of course, during the 10 years I was gone, it was I came out. Yeah. And moving back to my small town where people I went to school with existed. Yeah. And having people come up to me and they're like, I always knew you were gay. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Um, that but actually like, hurts me way worse than you think it does. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so interesting how, like, going back to the, the small town, uh, I actually posted a video on my YouTube channel about growing up near Lynchburg, yeah. Virginia. So yeah. Liberty University, biggest Christian university Love. in the world. Uh, I posted a video about everything I heard <laughs> echoed around me. Yeah. Um, and HBO actually reached out to me wow. and they're wow. like, we would love to come and connect with you. We've got a series that we're pushing out soon. And what we're doing is finding queer people who live in rural areas. And we'd love to like document. And it was very interesting because they interviewed like teachers at my high school. They interviewed the pastor yeah. from my church. Of course, they interviewed some professors from Liberty University. Yeah. Um, but growing up, up there and then proudly coming out because I moved to big cities. I lived in New York for a little bit. I lived yeah, in Chicago. Yeah. Then I lived in Florida. Um, so all of those were spaces where I learned what it felt like to be just accepted. Yeah. And then moving back, I learned what it felt like to be tolerated, yeah. which is a very different, very different. feeling right. yeah. than being accepted. And yes. I couldn't put my finger on why it felt so weird for a while until I realized that people were tolerating me. They're like, yeah. we will tolerate this gay kid standing in front of us. But it yeah. wasn't me where it was just, I'm Drummond. Yeah. I was Drummond the gay kid in the room. Yep. Um, and I was introduced that way. I had conversations with people, like one of my friends, she always introduced me that way. Yeah, And I was like, look, how would you feel if like, you walked into a room and I'm like, hey, this is my friend, my fat friend. Like, yeah. don't need to introduce people in a way. Yeah. And she was like, well, that was really hurtful. Why would you say that? I'm like, it feels the same way when I walk into a room. I don't know if you're trying to be helpful, but yeah. when you're in a rural area and you are introduced as something that automatically closes people's ears, yep. they don't even want to get to know you. They instantly judge you. I was yep. like, can you just introduce me as your friend and not keep labeling it? Yep. Because it was very interesting because my friends in the city, we had conversations about, about everything. Yeah. When I moved back to Virginia, every conversation anyone brought to me was like, did you hear about gay things that happened in this space and yeah. some place in the world? Yeah, or did you hear about this other person that's gay? <laughs> I was like... Um, no, I didn't. Uh, yeah. I, didn't, I guess I didn't watch the gay news this morning. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and did you ever find yourself, like, self-outing yourself in those types of environments as well? Like, almost preemptively protecting yourself? Because, like, I found myself a lot of times walking into rooms, and, like, when I'm doing it in somewhere like rural, rural Virginia, um, and I announce it that way, it's almost as a way of, like, let's get this out of the way, so that, because, you know, you're going to hyperfixate it on it anyway, so let me confirm your suspicions. And then I'll do the same thing in a very queer friendly space or just like a very accepting place like New York or DC or Philly. And people are like, okay, like <laughs> almost weirded out. Like why? Like, it's sick. almost like saying, hi, I have blue exactly. eyes. <laughs> it's like, like okay. awesome. You didn't, yeah, you didn't invent that. So yeah. <laughs> whereas in like rural Virginia, you kind of did. You're like you might be the first gay person they've ever interacted with. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I resonate with that a lot. Um, I had a point that I, or like a follow-up that I had to that, um, but it completely slipped my mind. <laughs> but I, I do, um, I completely understand that. And, um, oh, oh, it was um, when I would come home, I actually made, uh, in response to something you were talking about in an earlier video you made, um, I made a TikTok like a year ago because I finally posted, a, I posted like a two-year anniversary Instagram story for Eric and I, which again, like I didn't put anything online about him until I, it was very clear that I was gay, right? Like until everybody knew. Um, and so I finally posted a, like a happy two year anniversary and the number of people who 
flocked to my comment or flocked to my DMs to be to say like, we are so proud of you. We are so happy for you. This is so incredible. Who simultaneously bullied me to tears every day in middle school was absurd. And I love that they have now moved away from our world, like or our small like Virginia town and gone to places like Chicago and New York and DC and LA and caught like Denver and they've grown up and they've realized their mistakes. But I almost wish that they had just not said anything because it's it's like someone who is like trying so hard to be supported now who literally like ruined my like or actively tried to ruin my childhood for so long and then wants to come back into my, and I it, it almost villainizes them for me in a sense like they're they're trying to be friendly they're trying to be they're mm -hmm. trying to grow and they're trying to learn but on the back end like it almost just feels like they're trying to remedy a horrible, horrible wrong that they did for so long. So it's not a selfless act, right? You coming into my comments and, and, and saying nice things to me to make yourself feel better for the years of torment that you gave me, that's not selfless. You're doing that to right a wrong that you did. You're, but now you're bringing up trauma for me in my comments, reminding me of all the horrible things you said to me before you said this one nice thing, right? And so that's... it. it Coming out is just such an interesting <laughs> thing. And, and yeah. again, if I had done that in college rather than when, because I came out to friends and family, not, again, not even like my immediate family or my distant family, just my immediate family, when I was 21. Um, and it took until I started being on TikTok virally for like six months before I was fully out, which was around when I was 23, 24, right? I could not imagine putting myself through what I did as an adult when I was six, I, you said 18, but you were, I think your question originally was asking about like the 14 year olds, like the freshmen in high school who are trying to make like videos. I can't imagine having to experience that type of criticism and hate and also drudging up past trauma. Um, mm -hmm. Being someone without readily, like who doesn't have access to therapy, right? Someone who's like in a college and the backlog of therapists and like William and Mary let like alone had like a six month waiting list for students to go to therapy. Some people don't have six months. They need it now. Right. Yeah. And I can't imagine not having that access. And there are people in the real world now who's health don't have health care or who don't have uh, their health care doesn't cover uh, therapy. So they don't have the means for therapy. And it's, I just couldn't imagine. I'm very blessed with the timing of things. Even then there's probably room for where I could have started a little later giving myself a chance to figure out what I wanted to share before I started sharing it. But um, yeah, the, the transition and the, the coming out of it all, all being from a smaller, and again, like, I don't, do you consider Virginia Southern? Like, do you consider Virginia the South? I never have because I think I wanted to never, I never wanted to believe we were below the Mason Dixon, but yeah, we very much are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, we've been a blue state for so long. Um, and I feel like lately, I mean, we've got a red Republican governor yeah. right now, yeah. but I'm fully supporting the new Democrat candidate coming up. <laughs> but um, I, I've i seen Virginia stand strong in things that I believe in. So I'm proud of Virginia for that. But yeah. there's definitely a lot of red when you look at the map. Yeah. Uh, it's like you see the small little cities where it's safe. Um, but that's one of the things that I always try to remind people who have moved to the cities and escaped this rural uh, closed mindedness yeah. is you're in a special bubble because when I lived in the cities, I thought we had progressed so far. Yeah. And then I moved back and I was like, Oh wow, we haven't. We, so we are still trying to grow. So it's just like, remember when you're really loud and causing a ruckus and shaking the cage of the crazy people who are conservative and just have lots of hate for our community, that there are still a lot of baby LGBT yeah. community members that don't have the protection of a city around them. Um, so I applaud any LGBT person who comes out at a young age yes. um, and proudly states to the world this is who i am whether you like me or not absolutely but we do have to remember that their safety um it's not as secured as people who are in the cities um i always try yep. to get people to understand like in a crowd here in richmond if someone were to say something like faggot to me mm. 
most people would defend me. Yeah. Whereas in rural parts of the world and other parts of the world that have no rights for LGBT people, yeah. if someone were to attack an LGBT person, the likelihood of the community joining in on the bullying or the harassing yep. is a lot higher. Oh yeah. So it's important for us to remember like cities and progressive spaces need to find ways to bleed out and educate yeah. the rural areas. We can't all run to the cities. Yeah. Um, I'm a country boy at heart. So for me, <laughs> like when I go to hiking trails and drive out there and see like a hundred Trump flags before I yeah. get to the trail, I'm like, ooh, I better not run out of gas. I better not run out of <laughs> like, <laughs> my tire better not pop. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, you have to be aware that just because you found love and acceptance and social media creates it's like an algorithm bubble as well yes. for safety. And sometimes those scary people pop yeah. and get in. But I, I try to remind people, like, just because your current algorithm shows you tons of support, there's just as many platforms out there saying yeah. horrible things that are very threatening to our safety. Yeah. So it's just like being a young content creator, I think an adult should be very much supervising yeah. it. Um, I've Absolutely. seen younger people who their parents run their accounts. Mm -hmm. and I think that's probably safe. I think younger people should have to have comments turned off yeah. so that they don't receive that type of stuff. I, just because I think it's safer. I love the comments thing. I, if it wasn't so great for engagement, like, cause comment, comments are a way to boost videos. That's a way for me to reach more of my audience. Cause I, I you might not know cause you're more, or, well, you probably do know. That's probably why you're not as pre like as um, present on TikTok, but TikTok is so subject or I'm sorry, objective with how they boost your videos. So mm -hmm. it won't even show my videos to my followers unless it pops off in the first 15 minutes of posting. So like I relish in the fact that someone's willing to come and comment on my video, good, bad, or indifferent, because it means that I'm reaching more of my audience. And I never post video, like I'm, I'm a, the type of person I am, I'm not confrontational. I'm actually really bad at responding. That's why I block so many people. So I don't, I don't respond well. I don't respond well to negativity. So I just kind of remove myself from it. Um, so I don't actively create content that's meant to be contentious or meant to cause a stir um and so but, but sometimes like that stir does get me to my audience and so it's like it's very much a double-edged sword but i love the idea of turning that off for children because that's absolutely not what they need to be consuming at a young age when they're so impressionable and people will talk about oh they're impressionable so don't put them around gay people or they'll be gay no don't put them around hate comments or they will be depressed like let's rethink this impressionability and what's actually going to rub off on these people. Is it me being gay or is it the hate that you're giving to me because I'm gay? Let's think about it. Um, yeah. And so, but the thing that raises my eyebrows always is the, this is run by a parent and it's like, okay, but who chose to put them online? Cause there's that, there's a huge documentary out there that about, children stars who are like, I never wanted to be online. My parents are living vicariously through me mm -hmm. and using me and my image for their own personal gain. And I don't see a cent of the money that we make and they've turned their full-time job into documenting my life and ex exploiting my image for their personal gain. So I, I appreciate when a, a young person is has their account managed by a parent but it always raises an eyebrow for me. And I don't want to, if there's anybody who out there who is truly in it for their kids and all that money is going to their college fund, then <laughs> kudos to you. But yeah. I, it just, it raises an eyebrow because there's equal and, and, and opposite situations happening. So um, yeah, that's, that, that's a, I agree though, the, the comments. Also, I just wish that the apps would do better about blocking shit before we saw it, excuse me for my language. But the number of comments that Instagram lets, like the number of people who have called me a faggot on my Instagram post that I have reported to Instagram to take down or block those accounts and then come back to me and say, we don't see anything wrong with that, doesn't make sense <laughs> to me. Like it's, they're, they're complacent yeah. in the hate that's going on as much as they think that they're, that these, and then they're using, 
algorithms and AI to suss out these things. So then they're inherently blocking queer creators from posting content that is actually beneficial. So they're blocking people who are advocating for their community and blocking people who are trying to normalize what a norm, what a, that a gay relationship is just a relationship. They're blocking that because they see that as negative or maybe because that produces negative comments rather than just blocking the negative comments. And so there's a lot of, and I wish that we had a whole nother hour just to talk <laughs> about this because yeah. there is so much more that the internet has to offer that is like, that is positive. There's so much better we can do with fostering the ability for creators to, to post what we want and post authentic particularly without being like fear of being ridiculed. And so it's like, it's this weird, again, double-edged sword of like freedom of speech. You do like the beauty of our country is that you can be who you are and you can say that publicly. Um, while the other side is that some people are hateful. <laughs> that yeah. is their, their freedom is their freedom to hate you for no reason. And so it, not everybody can be empathetic. Not everybody can be compassionate. Not everybody can be thoughtful in what they say. Um, and a lot of people don't have access to things that help them to be compassionate <laughs> and empathetic and yeah. educated. And so it's a very interesting landscape, but it is, I, I know we're 16 minutes over our hour, so I appreciate <laughs> you hanging back, but I do just yeah. wanna say that it has been very refreshing to speak with somebody who's gone through all of this probably at a much larger scale than I have and for, has been exposed to it for far longer than I have. So um, it's nice to, to connect with somebody who has so much shared experience and, and, and we're able to kind of talk about these things live with people, you know, able to kind of hear what our opinions are. So I appreciate you, you having me on and it's been fun. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on here and doing that. And I will say that, I Instagram does have a setting where you can put certain trigger words that prevent people from using them in your comments altogether. Fag oh, okay. is definitely on my list of words people aren't allowed to use. Will, it will block. It will <laughs> block people's comments if they are using the word to sit like explain something and not in a harsh way. Yeah. But I'm like, you know what? Use something else if you're trying to do that. Yeah, uh, they do have like a list online that you can copy and paste into it on your account to prevent people from using words. It's it's helped me out I, a lot because I, I I was a big supporter of Biden um, in 2020. And because of that, it threw me right in the flames of all the hate. The politics, so yeah. I protected myself that way just by adjusting some of the settings. Yeah. setting it to where comments you have to be a follower to comment on my stuff so yeah. if it shows that you can't comment it's because you're not following me only true followers get to comment there we go <laughs> but yeah it was excellent chatting with you and yeah. i would definitely love to do it again sometime and i mean i'm just going to be over here supporting everything that you're doing <laughs> keep doing the content that you've got because i think anytime we can be represented in a positive way which you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, I'm all for it. So fully supportive over here. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm a new follower. So I'm really appreciative that you reached out and were so gracious to have me on. So I will be supporting you as well. And, you know, whenever you have a gap in people and you just want to chit chat with an extrovert, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. And thanks to everybody who joined. I didn't yeah. get to see who all joined, but love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>